like I kept listening to Brother Trim and I was like, oh, like he was explaining Acts 10. I was like, I'm kind of hesitant now about that gelatin in my cabinet. <laughs> I mean, it's like seriously, I was. I was like, I may yeah. I may have to like throw that out now. So good day to all the brothers and sisters out there watching the channel. As you see, we've got a special guest on the channel today and you see his name down at the bottom he's got Yah's world which i love that i love that name but on his facebook you go by is it chad christopher uh, yes brother chad christopher. okay all right well it's a blessing to have you brother chad it's a blessing to be on here thank you for having me brother chad and i became facebook friends and i don't know i think it was more than weeks ago but maybe a few months ago and just right from the get-go, I just discerned a good spirit from this brother. Um, I discerned uh, a, a good intellect, a good heart, good devotion, good discipline. And I said, you know what? This is the kind of guy I'd like to have on the channel to, to kind of chat about the scriptures. And plus, I was so excited because we had some key things in common, which was, it's, it's so rare. It's becoming more and more rare, brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's start by you giving us a little bit about your background and your upbringing, whether you grew up in the Christian faith, another faith, out of the faith. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so both of my parents, uh, thankfully, they were Christian, and so I was brought up that way. Uh, I never had a problem uh, believing in God, um, and it, it, the, the concept always seemed to make sense to me as a little kid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've never really identified with a certain denomination, so to speak. You know, like even as a kid, I just, you know, when my father um, read me the scriptures, particularly the Gospels, I just never got the idea that it meant anything to be a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Catholic. You know, right. it, you don't see that in the Bible, you know. Yeah, right. And right. Um, I just think I just thank the father that I never had that kind of spirit that, oh, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Catholic. And if you're not this, then you're not, you know, you're yeah, not thinking right. Yeah. Was, um, what, what kind of church, what kind of church did you grow up in? Did they have a name or a denomination? Or? Uh, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I've been to several churches. There wasn't okay. one church that I stuck with for too long. I mean, there's a Baptist church I think I started off in, and that mm -hmm. was just, you know, that's where my mother went and my grandparents on her side. And then when I went with my father, forgot what denomination that his parents went to that I went with, but I know him and my, and my father and I personally, we went to this little church called Church of the Nazarene. Oh, cool. Yeah. And um, and I, you know, there's a special little connection there in my heart, sure. especially in hindsight with, uh, we'll get to that. But there's, there's yeah. in hindsight, it's kind of funny how it all worked out. Then I went to more of a um, contemporary church in my teenage years for youth mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much, you know, youth group meetings for a while in my teenage years. And then I came to a Christian church. It's a more recent movement in America, oh, the past okay. couple hundred years, where they try to focus on the New Testament model for church, basically. And I forgot, I forgot what broad scope you call that, but it's a more contemporary church, and you yeah. know, it doesn't make a big deal of denominations either. So, cool, yeah. cool. We have a little Christian church right up the street from me. So, and and that and that's kind of how you described it. That's kind of how it is. So. Yeah. When did you start to study the scriptures for yourself? So I grew up in church too. I come from a family of pastors and music ministers and, and all of that, 10 evangelists, faith healers and all of that. So I can never not remember going to church, but I didn't start studying the Bible for myself, like really diligently until I was about 15 years old. How was it for you? Uh, let's see. So my mom and dad, they split pretty early in my life, like at five. And so I was with my dad for 10 years. He read to me the gospels. The gospel that stuck out to me the most was gospel of John for a while there, actually. And that was about say the age of 10 and up. I okay. read the gospel of John and the book of revelation okay. um, on my own. That's part of the study. I didn't spend too much time in the other parts of scripture, but as far as hardcore studying and reading, like all of scripture, that was, uh, see, my senior year of high school, so I was 18. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, I made a promise to God. I told him, I said, okay, like I realized, okay, I'm going to church. And the only two books of the Bible I've read is John and Revelation mostly. And I'm yeah. hearing a lot of what's being taught to me about the Bible. I need to read the Bible myself now. Yeah. And I told him after school's done, after I graduated, um, I'm going to just read the Bible. 
you know? Awesome. So 18 is the answer. And I just, I started, uh, I think I started in Genesis, if I'm not mistaken, okay. I just read my way throughout the scriptures. So, yeah. Wow. Anything stick out to you on that first reading? That's, that's the thing to this day. Uh, I cannot remember that first day. Oh, wow. Just, okay. Yeah. And the thing about that is, you know, I had a big video game addiction uh-huh. and I literally, I, before I graduated, I tried to read the Bible for more than 30 minutes and I just couldn't, my attention span was that lost. Wow. wow. Then it got to a point I said, okay, I made a promise to God. I had to keep it. And so I just told, I told God, I said, even if it strains me <laughs> to read this, I'm going to read it for more than 30 minutes. Yeah. And that first day when I opened up the Bible, I just could not remember that first day ever since. And it was wow. just very special. The spirit moved on me, but I know that once I opened it, I just couldn't close it. And yeah, I mean, there man. would literally be, I would have days where I'm in the Bible for eight hours straight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point to where it's completely flipped. God had flipped it on me. I tried to play a video game. I had to sh- had to force myself to go forty minutes. I was like, okay, I know it's over now. I'm not supposed to play this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he he completely flipped the script. And so that's so awesome. I remember yeah. my first Bible that my parents gave me was back in '95, and um, it was an old King James Thomas Nelson Study Bible. Mm-hmm. And I was the same way. I still have it. It's it's marked. Up. I mean, there's there's pages with holes in it where I would <laughs> handle them so much, you know, and I was the same way. I couldn't get enough of it. And I've not changed since then. So I'm, I'm thankful for the, you know, the spirit's work on my heart. Do you remember what particular Bible you started with? What kind of version translation? Uh, King James. King James. Likewise here. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> yep. and so then, what, what about now? I mean, do you prefer one now over the King James or do you still study out of the King James? Let's see. I was in the King James for a while, but then thankfully I had a brother that had a new like hardly read new King James, cool. which was great for me because it was it was proper still. I love the proper English to it, but not too proper to where I couldn't understand it. Yeah. Um, but it got to a point where I actually came across the NASB. Hmm. And I actually took a liking to that because it was a study note Bible. I bought it off of Amazon. And in many places, it was a more literal translation from the Hebrew and Greek. And so I appreciated hmm. that. And to this day, I still have it, have notes in it. Yeah, that is my uh, preference. It has yeah. its problems, but I do appreciate it. And I like the thoroughness of the lexicons in it. So Yeah, it's a great Bible. Great translation. Very word for word or wooden, which is good. You know, it's yeah. not that meaning for meaning is necessarily bad, but I have an, an NASB in my library and I, I like it too. So as you progress in your study and your, your diligence in the word, um, you started at 18. How old are you now, Chad? 25. 25. Okay. So about seven years, you've been really into the word. Do you remember like the first big truth, like as you're studying, what's the first big truth that you got from the Bible that you'd never heard before growing up in church, or maybe had, you've never heard anybody speak it. And you were like, Whoa, this is in here. I didn't know this, this would be in here when I started. The more serious thing is the love command. Hmm. So, uh, you know, you always hear it taught in church, love your neighbor as thyself. And you hear that from the gospels. But then when I started reading the Bible for myself um, at 18, I found that that's in Leviticus. Hmm. And I was like, why are they teaching this as though Yeshua made it up and they didn't have this before? It's like, hmm. it literally says it right there. And like, you know, I never brought it to, up to a pastor or anything, but I just noticed like, you know, wow, like it was there. Like it was actually the father's thing all along. And I was like, so that was, that was the first big truth that I came to realize. And yeah. it was beautiful. I actually had a respect yeah. for God's law at that point. Now, the funny thing. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) um, Were angels, what they look like. Oh, wow, yeah. (laughs) Like from Ezekiel and Isaiah and a little bit of Revelation. I was like, you didn't realize that they had four heads, some of them eyes all over their bodies, wheels with eyes. It's like, that was cool. (laughs) When did you arrive or maybe we'll say begin your journey in uh, theology, in particular Christology? When did you start studying about the father and the son what was the process there because it sounds to me like the churches that you were raised in were probably trinitarian i'm guessing Mm -hmm. okay when did you begin to question that did you read a pamphlet did you listen to a lecture it's really been years i would say in the making like i remember hearing about the trinity when i was a little kid Mm -hmm. and it just it didn't make sense to me 
You know, it's like, okay, so I literally depicted three different like spirit beings kind of floating in the church. I'm, I'm serious. I literally, I literally thought of it that way. Yeah. It's like, okay, is this God or it's talking about the Trinity of angels? What is this Trinity? And of course, as I became older, I started understanding the teachings about it. But to be honest, though, when I was reading, remember, I remember back when I was like, when I was an adolescent reading like the Gospel of John mm-hmm. and just reading like, some of the Gospels in general. I just didn't really get the immediate sense that God was a Trinity like they were saying. I just knew, that, okay, there's God who is Father in heaven, and then there's Jesus who is the way to the Father, as he said. And I have to believe that God exists and that this Jesus can save me. He's the only way to the Father. That's basically what's what I got from the gospel. You know, as I got further in church, started studying it, I saw the arguments for the Trinity. And so now when I can read those verses more, okay. I see what they're saying. And so then I became persuaded by it. I thought, okay, the Trinity is in the scriptures. But it's been years, though. I mean, like, I've, heard, I've listened to debates. I love watching debates, you know, especially over things I love, you know, passionate yeah. about. I saw the points that Jewish opponents, you know, against the Christian side, I saw mm-hmm. what they were saying. And, you know, it got me thinking, um, but I was still persuaded. I made up my own arguments for the Trinity. <laughs> I was really, uh, I was passionate about it. Talked wow. to Mormons, talked wow. talk to a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses before. But then... A couple years ago, I just I started coming more empathetic towards that side, like Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I could see what they're saying. I look sure. at the Greek. I could see what they're saying, you know, yeah. with that. And last year when I was really studying uh, Judy, like Second Temple period Judaism to get the background of the New Testament and also mm-hmm. parts the in-between parts of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. you know, as I mean, I'm using those labels strategically. I don't believe there's that distinction. But, you yeah. know, yeah, but I started looking more into it and I see what the Jews were saying. Like mm-hmm. when you ask a, the, a Jew what the Holy Spirit is, it's a completely different answer than what the Christians would say. <laughs> but I started seeing it. And then I started looking into um, the Unitarian side. I came across them. And so it got me thinking. I was like, you know, I think they have a point. I think they may be right, you know. And at that point, I came to the conclusion that, okay, I think Unitarians are still my brothers, even though I'm a Trinitarian. I don't think it's maybe a salvation issue like I've been taught from some people. So I'm glad the father put that on my heart. When I came to this realization that Yeshua is a man, mm-hmm. and not just a man, obviously the son of man, but you know that he is human in, in his state of being, that actually coincided with Torah. Mm-hmm. It, really, it really happened at the same time. The same time the father opened my eyes to Torah is the same time I just sense naturally in the spirit, I don't think Jesus is God, mm. like God Almighty. You know, I don't think he is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was last um, last March. Was it a wrestle? Was it like hard for you? Did you like lay in the bed at night? I remember when I, <laughs> I, I I've been a biblical Unitarian since about 04 over into 05, 2004, 2005. And I would lay in the bed at night and meditate until I went to sleep. And the, the verse that, I mean, there's so many verses, right? We could go over. But the one that got me was the Matthew 16, 13 through 18, where um, Yeshua says to his disciples, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? But then Yeshua looks and says, well, whom do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter, he he answers and says, you're the Christ or the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yep. Messiah means anointed one, son of the living God. And I, I started looking up that phrase living God in the, in the totality of scripture and saw that that was a reference to God's immortality. And But then Yeshua's response to Simon Peter where he said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my father who is in heaven. And I'll build the church on this rock or this revelation that you just uh, were given by the father. Um, So that means he basically applauded Peter and said, you got it right. You got it right, Mm -hmm. man. And so I would meditate on that verse over and over and try to figure out ways around it and under it and over it. (laughs) And I never could. And finally, one night I was like, I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah the son of the living God, if Yeshua stood in front of me, how could I answer the question any different than Simon Peter? And that's sufficient. I'm a, a saved person based upon that, that confession of of faith. There's nothing about co-equality, co-eternality, um, Mm -hmm. essence, substance, hypostatic union, none of that, all of that comes later and is developed later. So that was the big one for me. What was one that stood out and popped out at you that maybe you meditated about? Uh, let's see. It's, uh, John 17. Maybe verse three. That's usually a popular one. Yeah. So these, 
Yeah, these things Jesus spoke in lifting his eyes up to heaven. He said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee, even as thou gavest him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life. So he's defining what salvation is. This mm -hmm. is eternal salvation. He's, et he's mm -hmm. defining it. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That's mm -hmm. one of the biggest ones for me. Yeah. And to be honest, an, an anti, ironically, an anti-missionary Jew mm -hmm. pointed that out. It's like saying, like, look, this is proof that the early believers in Yeshua did not believe that he was God Almighty. Hmm. And it's like, that's a really good point. I mean, like, literally, like, you know, he says, I'm the, the way and the truth in yes. the life. The truth is that there is somebody that he's looking up to in heaven that is the one true God. Let's just say even if John, the apostle, was saying in John 1, he thought that Yeshua is God in the flesh, in that, hmm. like, that literal sense. Okay. Well, I mean, the thing to think about it is, who are you going to follow, John or Yeshua, whom he hmm. followed? <laughs> what does Yeshua say about himself, right? Mm. A lot of people I don't think would are willing to have that kind of mentality, you know? Mm. I'm not That's... saying John believed that. I'm just yeah. saying that even if he did, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Yeshua didn't believe that, you know? Yeah, but... there's kind of a hierarchy. It's not that we are trying to pit one scripture against the other. I'm, I'm following you because is that a lot of times when I talk to traditional Christians whom I love dearly, and they're my friends and my brothers and sisters, but when I talk to them about certain commandments, they automatically repeat the refrain, well, what about what Paul wrote? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, what about what Yahweh said? <laughs> thus saith Yahweh, thus saith yep. the creator. You know, let's start there and then let's work our way over to the, the writings of Paul. But it's like what Yahweh said kind of gets put on the back burner on the stove and Paul trumps everything. And I just think that's a wrong <laughs> hermeneutic, you know, and it's kind of like what you said. And with Yeshua, he's, he's the greatest man to ever live. He's the son of the living God. He is, he is God's anointed King, <laughs> the mm -hmm. Messiah. So it seems like his words would hold great, great weight. And we would consider what other apostles or sent out ones that he had, we consider what they say, but we consider it in light of what he's already said as the as the great teacher. I think right. that's kind of what you're saying there. Absolutely. And yeah. I, I agree with your Torah illustrations exactly the same way. You had the foundation and then you have those who are at the very least proclaiming to build on the foundation. It's up to us to test it by that foundation. What I come to find, though, is that John is actually one of the worst apostles to go to to try to prove that Yeshua is, Yeshua is God Almighty. Because wow. he, wow. Just he just records things that are just blatant i mean like that statement in john 17 i think later on in john where yeshua says my father and your father and my god and your god yes and then in revelation he like this yeshua speaking mm -hmm. saying the temple of my god in the city mm -hmm. of my god <laughs> like, yeah I mean, so, so you're telling this is this is posed like there's no more emptying himself he's not he's mm -hmm. not emptied anymore he's in mm -hmm. heaven mm -hmm. he's in he's in a glorified state all authority and creation Mm. And he's saying that there is somebody who is his God mm. four times in the same in the same breath. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, yep. I think like John has the biggest witness to me that he yes. is not God Almighty. Yes, you know? yes, yes. And it's not to diminish Yeshua. It's just no. to say that this is what he is and who he is. This yeah. is what he claimed. I'm just going to believe what he said. He says, you know, he tells us about tells us to keep his word. Right. Amen. I'm keeping his word. You know? I mean, yeah. yeah. Prior to me becoming a biblical Unitarian in my Christology, I had a man that was older than me show me Revelation 1 verse 1. And I had never saw what the man showed me in Revelation 1 1. And you mentioned something that triggered my mind on this. This is Yeshua in his exalted state, his resurrected state. And Revelation 1 verse 1 talks about the revelation of Yeshua, the Messiah which God gave to him. And I'm like, that's been there this whole time. And I've read it and I've never seen it. So here we have Yeshua in his resurrected state. God has to give him this revelation. So there again, we have the only true God. We have Yeshua who was sent by the only true God. And we have God giving Yeshua something. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. And all of these verses that have been in there for so long, over and over and over it's like a drum beat you know when you got a good a good song and you got a mm -hmm. drum beat that carries the song 
the drum oh, yeah. beat is son of God, son of God, <laughs> son of God. <laughs> First John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Hmm. Whoever loves the father loves a child born of him. Hmm. So again, another salvation statement. He says, hmm. whoever believes that Yeshua is the Messiah is born of God. Not hmm. that Yeshua is God is hmm. born of God. Hmm. You know, again, the same John that wrote John 1, if that was yeah. really the point he was harping home at is that he was God almighty. Why yeah. is he not saying it? Why is he saying something else? You know, great point. Great point, brother. Do you think that most people believe what we're talking about? I think, I think in my encounters with Christians that really don't know the doctrine of the Trinity and they've been raised in church. I think most of them, when you get to talk to them and I'll explain to them what I think, they'll look at me and they'll say, well, that's what I believe. <laughs> like I overheard a conversation with a brother when I was still going to church um, after I came to knowledge in Torah, I overheard a couple of brothers conversations about the Trinity. One of them is hardcore in it. Right. I mean, in a loving way, not like a militant way, but you know, mm -hmm. he's hardcore in the sense he's very passionate about it. He has it well thought out. Yeah. And the other brother said, I don't know, it's just hard to understand. The passionate one was like, well, that's the thing. I mean, you're not, you're not going to understand it. You know, it's a mm. mystery, right? <laughs> you know, and it's like, I was just sitting there listening. It's like, oh man, like I really, I want to be part of that conversation but at the same time. I don't know how it's going to turn out. So yeah. I, just, I just listened, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, but the difference though between those two brothers is one was actually a teacher, right? Uh -huh. In a very, a very good man, a very good brother. So he, he knows his stuff. He knows the arguments for it. The other one's just a regular person that is not a teacher. Like yeah. regular in that regard, you know. Um, so I think a lot of people, yeah, probably don't really understand it. To be honest, no. I didn't understand it. And I was no. I had arguments thought out for it, but I still didn't comprehend it. I accepted, well, it's a mystery. There's nothing really like him. And that just, I mean, really no one understands it. But there are those who can make the persuasive arguments versus those that can't. But yeah, I think yeah. most people, if they are just not been taught the Trinity – they would not, and just read the Bible for themselves, start to finish. Yeah. They would not come out the other end thinking that there's a Trinity. Yeah, I, really I, don't I think agree. So. I like how my brother in California put it. You know, he talks about how, because he has a lot of experience. Like he's in his, I think either 40s or 50s, and he's talked to a lot of people about this. Um, but, you know, he says in his experience, like he hears people say, well, you know, well, I was saved, right? You know, as a Trinitarian. And he brings up a really good point. It's like a lot of people who were generally saved people, they mm. think that a triune God saved them, but it's not that that's not the case. The fact is the God of scripture, the God of Israel saved them. And then mm. they were taught that that God is a Trinity. And then they look mm. back in their history, like in hindsight and say, Oh, well that triune God saved me. Therefore it must be true. Otherwise it wouldn't be saved. And that's not the case. That's not how God mm. works. Mm. You believe in the, the character of God, the true character of him, mm. you know, when you're saved, and whoever believes in, my name, right, will be delivered. Mm. They believe in the true power of God and his son, and therefore he saved them. And then mm. all the other stuff came after that, you know, traditions of men were taught to them. And that's what they think about God. It's a, So they're, they're taught to perceive their heavenly father in a certain way. It's a perception issue, you know. Mm. That's, and that's what I find about myself, too. I mean, like I told you, when I was a kid, even mm -hmm. an adolescent, I didn't really think naturally by bringing scripture that Jesus is God Almighty. Yeah. That, no, that came after. Yeah. Do you have close friends, Trinitarian friends, close brothers that you consider good friends, good brothers, good, good people of the faith? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, a, um, a lot of my friends are, you know, in, in the church. One of them in particular I talked to. It's awesome because yeah. I think a lot of people on both sides of the spectrum, hardcore Trinitarians and hardcore Unitarians, they they get kind of militant in thinking that, you know, maybe the other side doesn't have salvation or maybe the, maybe I need to, to stay away from that that person because they believe that way. I yeah. don't think that that's healthy. And I went through a phase of that on a few different doctrines um, early on in my, in my life. But the older I've gotten, the more, I guess, ecumenical I've gotten. I'm, I don't want to say that I just think everybody is, is okay in what they believe. Yeah. Um, but I think the most important thing is recognition of the father and the son. I don't think it's most important um, how all the nuts and bolts work. Um, but that you recognize that Yahweh is the Father, Yeshua is the Son, and and it's through Yeshua that we get to the Father. Uh, he's our ultimate goal. And a lot of the Trinitarians that I talk to believe that. And I would say that I would consider them my brothers or my sisters, um, even though 
some of them think I'm a heretic and going to hell. <laughs> right. So you came to the keeping of the Torah. What prompted you there? I mean, I know you weren't listening to necessarily biblical Unitarians to learn about the Torah because yeah. some of them, <laughs> a lot of them don't 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 believe in the Torah of, of Moshe at least. And right. what what prompted you there? What was it just Bible reading? Was it particular uh, teacher elder? Yeah, so I was um, I was with a brother at the time, um, and he really helped me. I actually I went through like a couple of years of a, of a spiritual rut, and I was just I could cut myself off from the church and just you know anyone yeah. really spiritual, you know. Um, it didn't stop believing that God existed or anything like that, and just yeah. I just I get kind of was giving, I was giving up on myself basically. Yeah. So I ran back into a brother that I just started to know at the church, and um, he's a teacher. He was a uh, minister of a disciples or of a, of a men's discipleship. And so, um, you know, very, very intelligent guy, very, very kind, very graceful. And um, we, we connected. He wanted to help me out. And uh, he thought that him and I would be a good pair to start teaching together. And I was hesitant to because, you know, I'm just I was just getting out of my rut still, you know, still yeah. had a ways to go. Yeah. Um but I also, too, the biggest thing for me is if I'm teaching, I don't want to lead anyone astray, even accidentally. Yeah. And so I really want to make sure I knew what I was talking about. And ironically, um, I was influenced by a while. Uh, he shared with me this study of um, Andy Stanley. Oh, Andy oh Stanley. yeah. Oh, I know yeah. Andy well. Yeah. <laughs> he's, real, he's real close to me up here in Atlanta. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's in the yeah. same state. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we went through his uh, book together. I got the book. I went through the video series and wow. I went through his article wow. that he def- that he defended himself, you know, because he thought he was being misunderstood by a lot of churches and he got backlash for saying what he said. Yeah. Um, so I, I thoroughly understood this guy's theology, under- thoroughly understood his, you know, his way of thinking. And I was persuaded by it, you know. Wow. Wow. Um, so but then, like, I was thinking about it more and I was like. I don't know. Is it really so simple as just taking the Old Testament out of the Bible? I mean, that's three. That's three fourths of it, you know. And it's like, then what's your foundation? And so I was like, okay, maybe the law is not for today to some capacity, you know, a little carry over here and there. But I still think I ought to study it, and I think I ought to study that little silence period between Malachi and Matthew, hmm. and, you know, to before I start teaching about the New Testament church, you yes. know, yes. and so. That that was on my heart. I couldn't shake it. And I wasn't going to mm. shake it either. I knew that was God putting on my heart. So I started studying Second Temple Period Judaism. Mm. I bought a couple of books. I watched um, a lot of videos from Jewish historians, even from mm. a secular his, from secular historians too. I mean, because I want to see okay if I hear it from secularists, Jew, Jewish um, historians, and Christian historians, and whatever carries through all three of those, I know it must be the truth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I started doing that. And then as I kept on studying about the different sects of Judaism in the mm-hmm. time of the first century, I come to find there was not an expectation of the law being done away with from any yeah. of those sects. Yeah. Um, like, and it's like, well, that's kind of odd. Why is it? Why is it the case then? You know, if they weren't expecting it. And then I I re- kind of re- I didn't remember what prophet said it, but it came to mind. Isn't there a prophet that said that God wouldn't do something unless if he first reveals it in prophecy? Mm. And I came to find that was actually from Amos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, where does he ever say he's going to get rid of the law? And then, you know, and of course, every church will quote, I think it's Jeremiah 31, right? <sighs> About yeah. the new covenant. Yeah. And it's like I start realizing, well, wait a minute. One of the hermeneutical principles that this very teacher that I was with, this this brother, he says, it like, you know, however you interpret scripture, you cannot make an interpretation that goes outside the realms of what they understood it as. Mm. So it, mm. so basically he, he would say scripture cannot be saying to us what mm. it couldn't have meant back then. Mm. And he would love to say that. And I mm-hmm. agree with that hermeneutic. And so I was like, yes. wait a minute. Yes. The Torah means something specifically. And the, the Hebrews – And the Jews would understand it as the law of Moses. Yes. And Yahweh said he's going to put the Torah on our hearts. Yes. So if he wanted us to separate ourselves from the Torah, why would he put it in the most intimate place in our soul? Mm. Amen. Amen. And so it's things like that. And then I think the two biggest witnesses to me were two Jewish brothers in Messiah 
Mm. One was Joseph Shulam, who was a brother in Israel. Mm. The other one is a James Scott Trim, who's here in America, in Texas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I listened to their teachings on Paul and their mm -hmm. teachings of the first century, uh, first century Judaism. Mm. And it just made sense. Like, I mean, mm. it lined up contextually with what Paul was saying. It yeah. lined up scripturally with what the prophets were saying. And I was like, I, I exhausted all my arguments against it. I was like, I cannot make an argument now yeah. against the law for today. I yeah. mean, and it, it fits with scripture. It's literally what scripture is saying. So it's like, I have yeah. a decision to make. Either I'm going to stick with what I've been taught or I'm going to stick with what scripture teaches me. And so, wow. Wow, man. When you come to this knowledge, you begin to speak about the law, the Torah, like King David did. Psalm 19, Psalm 119, you know, yeah. instead of saying the law is bondage, you start saying the law is perfect. It converts yeah. the soul. It makes the simple wise. It, it lights up the eyes. It's more to be desired than gold and sweeter than honey. You know, that doesn't sound like something that God's eventually going to say, hey, don't worry about all this stuff. You know, I want to chuck it out the window. <laughs> yeah, it was David wild. just, was David, had, did David have a bad case of Stockholm syndrome? You know, he yeah, was man. praising praising that which enslaved him to bondage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, lo the longest chapter in Holy Scripture, which is is divided by the Hebrew Aleph Bait, is Psalm 119, right? What we call Psalm yeah. 119, right in the middle of the of the book. And the whole the whole chapter is a praise to, to the Torah, to yeah. Yahweh's Torah. David even says, I lift lift up my hands to your commandments. A lot of times we miss that, you know, because we think, well, we lift our hands up to Yahweh. But David says, I lift them up to your commandments, which I think are an offshoot or are an extension um, of Yahweh. Kind of like we were talking about Yeshua being the embodiment of the wisdom and the word of Yahweh. So when we read the commandments, it's like we're reading we're reading Yahweh. We're seeing what he wants us to to be like, what, how he would have us to, to live. Brother, that's uh, that that was a great, great testimony up, up to your journey. And I guess this is what you were talking about. When you mentioned the Nazarene earlier, you're probably referencing, I think, Acts 24, the sect of the Nazarenes and them in right. history. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what James Trim went over that, and um, he had a he has video teachings on that and the mm -hmm. apostasy that took place after the apostles, and mm -hmm. you know of, of certain church fathers making statements about the law, mm -hmm. but then the bit and, and he he would cite them, he would cite it word for word and cite exactly where it came from, what year, and I looked it up for myself just to mm -hmm. test what if he, if he wasn't taking things out of context and wasn't you know misquoting mm -hmm. Jerome. I mean. Gosh, like he's, he even admits that the church fathers anathematized the Nazarenes mm. since the early days, right? Yeah. And um, there's a sect to that day, the Nazarenes, that still exist. And yeah. he, he told Augustine, he said, if we let them into the churches, we won't make them Christians. They'll make us Jews. Uh. <laughs> and I was like, well, hold on a minute. Paul was called the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, and he affirmed yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, so... Wow, that's Paul, the same guy you're using to say the law's done away with. And so he's a Nazarene. And these yeah. Nazarenes were different from Jews in that they believe Yeshua is the Messiah, yep. different from the broader Christian world, and that they kept the law of Moses. Yeah. It's like, yeah. well, this whole thing I've been with my brother with was getting back to the New Testament church. That's the New Testament church. And as my brother James, uh, James Trim said, there are two things the New Testament church didn't have a New <laughs> Testament and a church. <laughs> <laughs> I heard I heard James Scott Trim say that man. I think it was in the early two thousands. I, mm. I started. I came into the Torah movement in in ninety seven, nineteen ninety seven. Biblical Unitarianism took me a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, but I heard. I think I heard James say that um, in the early two thousands, and I laughed. I think I was listening to it on a cassette tape. As a matter of fact, and I laughed. <laughs> and I have used that line so many times in witnessing to people and just talking with people casually. I'll ask them what's two things the New Testament Church didn't have, <laughs> and usually people will chuckle when I, you know, when I tell them. And then they'll be like, "Hmm, let me let me meditate on that. I, I think I see what Matthew's saying." You know, <laughs> how did you first start applying the Torah to your life? Did you start off with any one particular commandment or a group of commandments? and how difficult or easy was it for you at first? Um, not that the Torah is difficult, but sometimes it can be difficult when we're becoming unconfused, right? And having to change our lifestyle into something that we've, you know, used to be foreign to us. The dietary commands. Okay. 
that that was that's what started off that because like i mean and i was already kind of making that shift in february because like i kept listening to brother trim and i was like oh like he's explaining acts 10 i was like i'm kind of hesitant now about that gelatin in my cabinet <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's like seriously i was i was like i may yeah. i may have to like throw that out now and i oh, did wind up throwing it out that's awesome that's um, awesome throughout my uh my ham my sliced ham you know because like Praise it was God. in march when i made the full decision okay i have to walk in this now because like yeah. i there's no other way that's that is the truth yes, and yes, um yes. it started with the the dietary commands and then the sabbath you know yeah yeah so you know in the chronology of it you know what i said you know the first the dietary commands and then the sabbath now with the sabbath that was that was hard for me and okay. why not because i didn't want to but because i wasn't trusting god at first that things would go okay and mm -hmm. it was definitely it was definitely for one thing my flesh just being weak but then I, mm -hmm. I think the enemy too was putting bad thoughts in my head about it like things mm -hmm. just going to just go wrong that's all that's going to happen is go wrong and so there were months where you know i i delayed you know um like i i did i had to move out of my job because my job was a primarily weekend job but then yeah. for a while i just wasn't working i was just i was studying but i wasn't really working though and that wasn't healthy because yeah. i was like i was afraid to like put that oh saturdays i can never do <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot, you know, a lot of jobs are like, you know, require weekends or weekends yep. are preferable for the employers. <laughs> it's like, yeah. so, I mean, for a while I, I did, I, I was in the state of um, stagnation yeah. on that issue. And it's like, well, I'm not really keeping the Sabbath if I'm not working like at all, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's something that, that the father put on my heart. And then a brother without me even saying that said the exact same thing. It's like, okay, well, yeah, this is God talking to me. I just got wow. to wow. put up or shut up and just, you know went ahead and got out of that and just, just applied and just had yeah. faith. So and, um, if you had to give a word to somebody, because you know, there may be somebody watching that is dealing with the same thing. And I know it can be scary, especially when you're used to working, you know, any day of the week and you just are not sure that the Lord will provide with you taking the Sabbath off. What, what kind of word would you give of encouragement? Because you've been through that. You've, you've walked that step. Uh, to people that that may be there right now, I would say Isaiah fifty six. Mm. Thus says Yahweh: Preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Mm. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh say, Yahweh will surely separate me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to Yahweh, to minister to him hmm. and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. I love it. And it kind of goes along with Isaiah 58. If anybody's following along in their Bible, Isaiah 58, 13 through 14, I won't read it, but I'll let you, the listener or the viewer go and read that and see how that Yahweh will bless you for obedience to the Sabbath day, obedience to all of his commandments, bring a blessing. What does he say in Deuteronomy six? I think verse 25, he says to, to the Israelites, he says, I've given you these commandments for your good. For your good. It's like he's given them to us. But when we step out on faith and just obey, we start to learn, Hey, these are beneficial for our life, not just spiritually, but physically, mentally. I mean, they're, they're, they're all, they're all good. The law of Yahweh really is perfect, as Psalm 19 says. Brother, where are you fellowshipping now? Do you fellowship mostly on social media, online? Uh, do you have a local congregation that you attend or a, a small group or anything? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's a, there's actually a few families um, in this part of Kentucky that are, well, really several families that are Torah observant, but a few of them that have farms. And they alternate uh, Shabbats, you know, to that this farm or that farm. And that's why we have like big gatherings. And then there also is a um, a brother and sister I'm connected to. 
here in my particular area, general area, where, you know, if it's in between Shabbats where there's not a big gathering, yeah. they'll have me over for their house if they're not doing something with, you know, with their immediate family. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, that was, that was a blessing because I tell you, I felt like a fish out of water. Man, <laughs> last I March. Know. It can be lonely. Yeah. It can be yeah. very lonely. I'm glad that you have some actual fellowship. I have so many people contact me and we have a local fellowship here. And if everybody is here and nobody is sick or out of town, we probably have 60 people. Um, and this is regularly every, every Shabbat and, and every new moon as well. We gather. And of course, on the on the annual festivals and people will contact me and we offer our services on Facebook Live. And we ha even have a phone number where people can call in and listen because some people that listen to us have never owned a computer. Right. So, yeah, we forget there's still some people on the earth like that. <laughs> but, but they They tell us or they tell me, they say, Brother Matthew, you don't realize, I think you don't realize how special it is to actually have flesh and blood fellowship, to be able to meet with brothers and sisters, not just over a computer screen, not that a computer screen doesn't have its pros. And I believe it's a blessing. I'm so thankful that I get to know you, you know, just through this recording, this has been a blessing to me, this discussion, Likewise. Um, but I'm glad that you have, you know, somebody that you can hug and say, Hey, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. And you can, you know, flip the pages of the Bible with and, and, and look at and, and sing with and, and share testimonies with. I, I know it's been a great blessing to you since you had, you felt like you had nobody last March. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And luckily it wasn't really for that long. I mean, um, I reached out, you know, David Wilbur. Uh, yes, I know him. I know him through Facebook. I've never met him, but I know him through Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's a very responsive brother. You know, I, I reached out to him on Facebook and he messaged me pretty quickly. You know, I asked yeah. him, like, like, I told him, like, I feel like I'm alone. Like, how am I going to get fellowship? And yeah. he said the one teen ministry fellowship finder. And yeah. yeah, it only took about like a week for a response from somebody. But yeah. And that's actually that's the family that I go to on those in-between Shabbats. And they actually take me to the farms. I don't have a wow. car myself right now. Okay. So they, they um, help me get around. And so, yeah, I mean, it didn't take long. I think, I thank the father for doing that. Cause Praise you, know, God. you never know how long it will really last if you're alone. It's probably won't be yeah. for that long. So brother, I thank you for your time and for your testimony. Um, my wife will be getting home here in just a few minutes and she's going to want to eat dinner with me and I, I want to eat <laughs> dinner with her. So, <laughs> so, uh, but I do thank you for your time and, um, you've been a blessing. You're a blessing to me on Facebook. Uh, I appreciate how you conduct yourself. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but I appreciate how you conduct yourself on social media and how you strive to be articulate and to the point and your answers, uh, especially some of the ones that I've seen on my threads where you've commented and interacted with people. Yeah. Um, I didn't get a haughty attitude from you. Got a very humble attitude from you. And uh, and also an attitude where, you know, that wasn't my way or the highway. But let me share with you what the way I see it. And let's talk about it. And uh, that goes a long way with me. Um, it made me think of Second Timothy where Paul wrote uh, to Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. And I, I got that vibe from you, brother, and I, I appreciate that. Oh, well, I appreciate you. I thank you for having me on. It's it's a huge blessing. You, you have a, I can sense you have a spirit of gentleness, and I can see mm -hmm. that. I watched your debate you had a couple years ago, and I just watched that a couple weeks ago with uh, oh. Shaw, 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 yes, Shaw. Yes, on the virgin birth. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, um, both of you conducted yourselves well, but you know that can that's a passionate topic. You know, yes, especially for those who are trying to defend the virgin birth. And I never sensed that you were getting agitated. I mean, you really just wanted to try to help him. Mm. And you wanted to also convey to the audience, okay, here's a reasonable defense for the virgin birth. And so yes, yes. You know, I, I got that. Okay, yeah, this is a brother that's reasonable. Mm. And that, you know, whether or not he's right or wrong scripturally, he conducts mm. himself in that Christ manner, you know, that mm. Messiah manner. So. Thank yeah, you, they, you've been a huge blessing to me. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Well, I pray Yahweh's blessings upon you, and I hope that we get to know each other more and maybe even one day meet, maybe at a feast or something. Who knows? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. 